go. What is going on, guys? Welcome back to the Wipeout Podcast. My name is Fernandez, and each and every episode, it is my goal for you to walk away having leveled up your movements and or your mindset so that you can go and live your fittest and most fulfilled life. And this episode is pretty different. And I sit down with ex-army sniper and men's coach, Keegan Bizzle, to talk about how to develop the skills of resilience and self-love. And you might be like, I thought this was a movement podcast. I came here to learn how to get jacked. Fuck you, I want my money back. And to that I say, you didn't pay anything for this, so joke's on you. And also, it's hard to understate the value of the kinds of things that Keegan talks about and the kind of lessons that we tease out from him telling his story, going to and joining the army, becoming a sniper, team leader, all the way through to his journey, his journey opening a movement gym, and then going on to becoming a men's resilience, co- resi- resilience coach after that. There's so many nuggets and so many gems in here, and there's also some really practical things that you can apply, take those kind of skills of resilience and self-love down from their more esoteric realm and start to apply them in your own life. So there's gonna be so much for you to get out of this one. I really hope you enjoy it. And without any further ado, let's get to it. Please welcome my guest, Keegan Bizzle. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, actually. Yeah, it's um Yeah, I appreciate you doing this and Dude, doing what you do. Thank you, man. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you more. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be fun, man. I'd love you to start by just telling people your name and what it is you do. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so my name is Keegan Bizzle, and I am a men's coach, and I run fourteen-hour resilience events on the Sunshine Coast. Love it, love it. It's the elevator pitch, the short one, and we're gonna get, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're gonna get into the way, way longer one right now. But it was, <laughs> it was funny. I, I googled your name in the research for this podcast, and it's so funny. So many things come up. There's, you know, there's the the resilience coach and the men's coach. There's you also do work with women. I understand it as well. There's, you've owned a gym. You've been into property and crypto investing. You've been a sniper in the army. And I want to start off the podcast in kind of maybe a bit of an unexpected place, but have you always been so self-directed in your learning and your approach to diving headfirst into things? And and if so, like, where do you feel like you got that from? Yeah, man. Great question. I actually, funny enough, I, I typed my name into Google for some reason the other day. I think I was trying to find something and I saw all those things come up and I was like, wow, that must look really confusing because it doesn't give you like a clear snapshot of what this guy does. Um, but for me, this self-directed, uh, drive, as you will, to, um, I guess, achieve the things that I wanted to came from essentially my family environment. So my family was, uh, a a football family and my brother ended up playing for Geelong Cats and Melbourne Demons. And I ended up spending a lot of intimate time when we were down in, in Melbourne and Geelong with him and these professional players that were on TV kicking goals and making tackles and being being close to him and being in the dressing rooms and carrying his bags around really humanized the experience and I think psychologically it just it, it put in my mind this ability and this belief that I was capable of doing anything and mm-hmm. so like growing up that's that's kind of you know I said I wanted to be a professional football player and I started to go down that route a little bit and when it didn't eventuate that's when I kind of you know, changed course, but the drive was, I guess, still there. So, yeah, that, and then that obviously bled into all these different things that you said, like the army, running a gym, property investing, crypto investing, running these resilience events, and that's kind of, uh, yeah, where we where, where we are today. Dude, I think that's such an important thing. I certainly hope that if slash when I have kids, that that's a, that's an environment I want to foster as well because I, it's. It's really apparent. I remember when I first met you as well, it was really apparent that that really shines through. And so to, yeah, to have that environment where you can make those things not only okay, but you can really instill the importance of those things as well, I think sets you up for, because there's going to be so many things that we're going to need to learn and fail at more importantly. And so to have that self-belief fostered in that learning mindset, I think is really, really powerful. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of, it's interesting when, when I tell my story or, or I listen to other people's stories, it sometimes seems like it's quite linear and that uh, it was always meant to be. But, w- you know, within that, within the last 29 years of my life, 
and, and especially like from 17 to 24, 25, there was a lot of um, dark shadows and I, and I was actually living, I was living a life based on what people wanted rather than what I wanted. Mm. And so a lot of the decisions that I'd made were based off, um, for example, when I was about 16, 17, I decided to join the army because I thought I was weak and I wanted to prove to my dad that I was a, this strong this strong kid of the family because I loved hugs and I was really affectionate and I would play AFL and when there'd be a, a fight on the field, I wouldn't get in the fight. I'd just stand back and go, this is stupid. I just want to kick the footy and like, you know, run around and have fun. And And dad was always like, just fucking get in there. Why don't you get in there and help your mates? And I was like, I don't know. I just don't really feel like doing that. And so the way that I, the way that I learned to get my dad's love was through, you know, being really good at something and trying to prove myself in, in something that he really loved, which was football. And so when I failed at football, I was like, well, how am I going to prove myself to, you know, my family and my friends and how am I going to toughen myself up? And the next best thing came along, which was the army. So that was kind of my catalyst to actually join in the army. Yeah. Wow. Man, thanks for sharing that, dude. Like that's, I think that speaks volumes about the amount of inner work that you've done to be able to not only realize that, but also to own that story. And yeah, you were saying that a lot of times it looks linear when you look back on it, but at the time I can really imagine it didn't feel like that. And we were like, oh, I think I want to get more love from my dad. So I might go join the army. It's yeah. never really how it feels. Like what was your narrative no. around? I can imagine that must've been pretty tough at the time to realize that maybe your football career wasn't going where you wanted it to go. How did you realize that? And at the time, what were you, what was your mindset around going and joining the army? What did you feel like it was at that time? Yeah, so... There was a lot of pressure around me to be a good football player. And, you know, I'd, I'd go to training or I'd go to games or I'd go to the district um, competitions and, and people would be like, oh, you're Clint Bizzle's brother. You know, you must be good. And there was this massive weight and expectation that I was going to play really well. Mm. And so that got really heavy. And I eventually just kind of fell out of that loop. And then I remember at the time... It, this was towards the end of grade 12. I, I kind of didn't really know like what I wanted to do, but I wanted to do something adventurous and I wanted to um, do something that was really hard and that really challenged me almost. But, but again, it, it was coming, a lot of that was coming from a place of like, shit, I need to, I need to get my shit together and I need to like prove my worth and I need to work hard and, And it's only now looking back that I realized that I was, you know, there was a part of me that was doing it for my dad's love. Uh, Not, not the whole part. I think that's important. You know, I love breaking up ourself into, into different parts and really looking at different parts. And that part that was seeking validation from my family was just a small part. And there was other things that were playing into it, but it it definitely did have an impact on, on me going, well, hang on. Yeah. I'm going to do this thing that's really out there and, and fun and, and hard, but um, yeah, a little bit risky. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love what you said about the parts as well, because that's just that alone fucking changed my life. And, you know, there's a, once you kind of accept that to be true, there's so many practices around that that can kind of, yeah, really start to understand that you're not all of that whatever feeling you feel like you might feel like you're being consumed by is not you in totality and you actually have a relationship with that part of yourself. And there's many of those parts that are just trying to keep you safe. Yeah. Yeah. To- exactly. They're just trying to keep you safe. That's all they're doing, man. And when I realized that it was beautiful watching those parts come up. Like mm-hmm. when I get triggered, I'm like, where's that, where's that coming from? Especially in my relationship. I get triggered mm-hmm. in my relationship all the time, man. Cause my woman is fucking wild and she <laughs> tests me to the nth degree and i've always got a i've always got to check in with myself and be like okay yep this part of me is really triggered it's beautiful because it's all it's doing is just trying to keep me safe mm. and um yeah n- you know knowing that has helped me navigate so many things in my relationship and my life in general where did you first come across this what happened like 
what was that experience like and, and where was that? I think it might have been, I did a course called Landmark when I was 17 and I think they touched on it. And then I revisited it uh, maybe two years ago when I did a, uh, a course called EMC, which stands for Elite Money Club. And the, and the guy that ran it, multi schoolionaire he has done a lot around psychology of the selves mm. and how that plays into marketing and business and success. And then after that course, I ended up doing some relationship coaching with a guy called Jack May, who's a really good friend of mine down uh, sort of Byron Way. And he he comes across, um, or he, he approaches coaching in the way of nervous systems and identifying different parts of yourself. And essentially what we were saying before, like those parts are just trying to keep you safe from a certain thing. And then- you know, like, so this theme kept coming up around selves and like safety and nervous systems. And then I got really intrigued and I started to use that in my own coaching and started to see results for people. And I'm like, fuck, this stuff's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. so powerful. It really is, man. I'm part of a, a, a brotherhood as well. Um, they're called the Peace Timeline. And a lot of a lot of the work revolves around this kind of parts of us theory and parts of us work. There's ties back to internal family systems, which is a kind of like a psychological therapeutic avenue as well. But yeah, man, that's that's really that's really cool and so powerful to be able to look back on that narrative with so much hindsight. And I think there's so much kind of healing power because, like you said, going through that experience, there was a lot of darkness in there for you. And I'd love to kind of ask you a couple more questions about what that time was like for you in the army, going and joining up as a 17 year old kid, and then what that path looked like to go and then becoming an army sniper. And yeah, what was that? What was that like? Yeah. I can tell you that the first three months was probably <laughs> the hardest um, because you don't really know what you're getting into, right? And so you get on this bus and, and we start driving um, to this almost unknown location because you don't really know where, like, you know where, roughly where you're going, but you, I've never been there before. And at the time, <laughs> I was so sick because I went on this camping trip a couple of days before as like a send off and I was drinking the creek water and I think I was. I was punching durries and stuff and I was just like not doing healthy things. And so I got in this bus to go to the army and I was so fucking sick, man. I was like mad flu sitting at the back and everyone's having fun. Everyone's getting G'd up about joining the army. And I get there and I had to go to hospital for the first week and, and miss out on the first week because I was just too sick to, sick to start. But as soon as I got into the lines, which is like your sleeping quarters, it was game on, man. The first three days... I don't think I've ever been more stressed in my entire life because you walk in there and it's a massive cultural shift. They take your phone off you. They, you know, they uh, take all your clothes off you. You put, you put all your clothes in like a trunk under the bed. You basically don't see them for the next three months. Maybe you, maybe you see them once. They dish out, they dish out the uniform. You start wearing the uniform. You start learning how to iron it. And then every morning at 6 a.m., they would blast Revali, which is um, like the bugle tune over the loudspeaker. And you would grab both your bed sheets, chuck them over your shoulders, run outside, line up, and then wait for the corporal to come past and do a, you know, do his little spiel. He'd do a little spiel. And then you got like 15 minutes to have a shower, have a shave, make your bed, put your uniform on, and then stand back outside, lining up, ready to go. And the amount of adrenaline that you would feel every single day for three months straight was just off the scale. And and day two or three, I remember laying in my bed, and it was like it was like five fifty five, and and you get to this point where your your body clock and your nervous system are so lined up that you you fucking know that that revali is going off in the next like five minutes, and you're laying there, and I'm just like, like what am I doing? This is this is fucking stupid, man. Like, why am I here? And I ended up, um, I ended up having like some, some deep conversations with my roommates. And they basically said like, you're not leaving dude. Like you're here now we're here. We're in this together. And I was like, all right, man, let's do it. Let's do it together. I'll, I'll just stay for you guys. And that's pretty much why I stayed like past the first week I stayed there for them. And then it became about, you know, staying there for me after that point. And that kind of continued for three months. I wasn't, I wasn't a very good soldier at the start. I kind of got, um, 
I got drilled on a lot because I was quite young and a little bit, um, a little bit mouthy. So um, yeah, a little bit too lippy for what, what they wanted. And so I ended up getting drilled quite a lot. And then after basic training, I went straight to infantry school. There was three months there. Wasn't particularly that great. And then after infantry school, I went to my battalion, which was six RAR. And I got there just after the soldiers came back from Afghan. And during that trip, there were a whole bunch of casualties. And so the entire battalion was in this really somber, angry uh, mood, right? And, and the tension was so high, you could, you could feel it in the air. And being a new soldier at the battalion was it was hard it was really really hard because these these soldiers had just come back from overseas and and they're looking at you know this wet rag that's just come in and doesn't know anything and the expectation on me to perform was again like so high and but the knowledge wasn't really there and and the experience wasn't really there and so i kind of got looked down upon a lot and then over the next probably three years or no it would have been two years i, I got absolutely absolutely railed like the amount of abuse that i would have copped would have would have been insane and it's pretty common for that to happen it's just kind of like a normal thing like an initiation um and and it got to a point where i remember standing in my room one day and i was just the energy was just so heavy and i was like again i was like what am i doing here like this is this is stupid I'm getting treated like shit and I just didn't want to be there anymore. And I got, I got super depressed for maybe a couple of weeks because I was going through like this really rough time. And I think the worst part was I ended up going out and drinking and getting on the piss just to escape the reality that I was living in and get a little bit of reprieve. And that was a common thing, just going on the piss like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just filling up and, and trying to forget about work for a couple of hours. And um, I remember rocking up on, I think I was supposed to get to work on on a Saturday morning or something to go to the range. Anyway, I was late and the corporal just started beasting me uh, and saying like, you know, where are you? The buses have left. You're in the wrong uniform. What'd you do last night? Where's your phone? I didn't have answers to any of those things. I lost my phone. I had the wrong hat on. I, sm- I reeked of piss. Um, and, you know, I got told to just go away and come back on Monday. And so end up going to a festival that weekend. Didn't really learn my lesson, but um, I was like, yes, I can go to this festival and everyone else is at the range. And then the hurt came on Monday when I got marched into the uh, company sergeant major's office. And he basically stood like this far away from me, like a couple inches. And he was just screaming like the loudest I've heard anyone scream and spit was coming out of his mouth. You know, what the fuck do you think you were doing? you fucked up. You should have fucking been there, you know, blah, blah. And I was just like, oh my God, like, what have I done? I am the worst human in the world. And uh, I think I ended up, I think I ended up crying in the office. I was just standing there just like, my, I was Fair just enough. like freaking out, man. And it was super rough. And from that day on, I decided that I was going to, I was going to basically clean my shit up and I was going to be the best soldier that I possibly could be. And so after I left that office, I went to my SECO, had a conversation with him, but SECO is a section commander. So he's, he's in command of like, you know, 10, 11, 12 guys or whatever it is. And I basically said, I want to carry the gun. Give me the heaviest gun. I want to carry that. I want to, I want to provide for the section. I want to, I want to be of value. And so I ended up doing that for two years. And it's a, it's a heavy beast of a weapon and you've got to carry all this ammo. Um, and I eventually, I eventually got seen as someone that was putting in the work. And then they said, uh, oh, do you want to do the recon course? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to do the recon course. That'd be cool. You know, I've always, I've always wanted to do um, some form of like sneaky peeky job. So they basically go ahead and do a bit of reconnaissance on terrain and, and report back. So I did that course, wasn't particularly good at it, but finished it. And the uh, directing staff on that course went around and were asking people who wants to do the basic sniper course. And in my mind at this point, you know, that was so unbelievably far away that I just thought it was laughable. I was like, hang on, these guys are asking me to do the sniper course and I, 
almost underperformed at this reconnaissance course. And, and they think that I might make it. And I'm like, is this a joke? And so I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm not going to do it. And the guy comes around again and he goes, guys, look, you know, we need people. There's guys leaving the battalion. It's going to be fun and, you know, <laughs> you're going to enjoy it. And I'm like, he's taking the piss, surely. And, uh, and I was like, whatever. All right. You know what? I'll do it. I'll do, I'll do this. I'll give it a crack. I'll give the basic sniper course a crack. And then the next, uh, the next 10 weeks was prepping for the course and then doing the course, which was, um, it was just intense learning every single day and assessments every single day for a good six, seven weeks. And again, I've never felt more pressure to succeed or, or more stress to succeed than I ever have. And I think the interesting thing about the army is when you're in these courses and you're doing, doing these things with other people around you, it's just, it's all about the mission. It's all about the purpose. It's all about putting one foot in front of the other and, and consistently working to achieve the goal. Right. So it, it then became this, this normal thing for me to set the bar really high and then know that if I just consistently kept chipping away at this goal, I would eventually get there. And so at the end of the course, I was one of two to pass outright somehow. I have no idea. It just happened. I just consistently showed up. And I think maybe maybe praying to the sniper God had something to do with it. Every night I would get on my bed and I would put my hands together and I'd be like, dear, dear sniper God, please let me pass. And like the boys were taking the piss. They were, they were like, you know, who are you praying to, mate? And I'm like, the sniper God, bro, he's real. He's going to help <laughs> me get through. And I guess he did. I guess he did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I ended up finishing the course and then basically from there ended up doing a sniper team leader course, which is like the next level above that. Um, didn't do like crazy good at that, but I passed and, you know, probably like the middle of the pack. Um, and then spent the next four years in the battalion serving as a sniper team leader, leading me and another guy around the bush, setting up a, a hide position and getting ready to um, take a shot on target. Dude, what an incredible story. Holy shit. <laughs> it's been a wild journey. Yeah, man. And so going back to that, that moment where you had that guy inches from your face just fucking absolutely screaming at you, mm. why do you think that made you, why do you think that was the moment? Because it sounds like you copped a lot of abuse and trauma before then. So why do you think that was the moment that made you want to take responsibility and turn like turn what is essentially your life and your, your career in the army around? It was it was this deep feeling of like shame mm. for for just yeah, just really just royally fucking up. And and I'd experienced it many times before. And I kept seeing these patterns repeat. Mm. And I'm like, I'm in the same place. I mean, literally the same place. And I feel like I haven't learned anything. What's, what's going on here? And I was really out of integrity, I think. I wasn't, I wasn't actually fully committing myself to the, the job that I signed up for. I was just, I was like one foot in, one foot out, you know, going and getting pissed on the weekends, not really like studying for my job. Um, not really looking after my health as much as I probably should be. Wasn't surrounding myself with the soldiers that I necessarily wanted to be around, which was like the reconnaissance and the sniper guys. And so when it happened again, it just, it, it triggered something in me that just went like, wow, I felt this before. It's either, it's either I give up now or I change something and start to progress to someone that I want to be. And that's probably as simply as, as I can put it. It was a very different situation, but I've been in a really similar situation where it's just that pattern repeating itself is such a, for me, when I looked back on that and realized I was in exactly the same place and two years again, again, it passed for me as well. And I was like, 
what have I done? What have I learned? What have I achieved in that time? And yeah, exa- exactly. Like the pain of being out of integrity, of not living in accordance with your own values, when that's fucking shoved in your face, that's super fucking painful. And that, yeah, in my experience, that can only happen so many times before it gets to some kind of breaking point. And I don't mm. really believe that there, there's rock bottoms all the way down. But at some stage, you can use that momentum to bounce back. And Yeah, and I think, I think it's important to understand that my journey has just been like when I joined the army or even when I was getting yelled at then, or even when I finished the reconnaissance course, or even when I was in the basic sniper course, I never, I never thought that I would actually be at the point that I was at. I never thought yeah. that I would have even got on a reconnaissance course or on a sniper course, but it was just, it was just literally showing up every single day and trying to absorb as much information as possible. And just, just being good at my job just showing up and being good at my job. And then, you know, like four years later, I was one of the most highly qualified soldiers in the battalion at that time. And, and you know, I, I probably held that sort of um, that status for maybe six to 12 months or something. And I was super proud. I was like, wow, I've gone from like the shittest soldier to one of the most qualified. Wouldn't, wouldn't say that I was the best, the best sniper there. There was some really, really switched on guys. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of had like the most qualifications under the belt and um, had achieved some, some pretty crazy things and had grown heaps. And I was like, fuck, you know, that's, that's pretty sick. I just did that by consistently showing up. And that's such a fucking powerful lesson as well. From what I know of you, you've taken that on for the rest of your life as well, but it's so similar to movement training as well, where, and so many things, I think we can get sold this, this promise of if you just like set this super lofty goal and then you just kind of like really visualize the goal and there's so much focus on the end point that sometimes for me in the past, that's created a lot of anxiety around will I get there? Will I won't get there? Mm. Will I not get there? Sorry, what's the best way to do it? Should I start this? Maybe not this. Maybe I should go this way instead. And that's led to me showing up less and doing less of the actual work and Mm. training less or being less consistent. And the idea that you just show up and you just do what's in front of you and you do that to the best of your ability, that's how most people get the most progress. And even if your process isn't as good as the absolutely perfect, most optimal thing in the world, those people still make far more progress in the long run than the person that's still stuck on the starting line trying to figure out how to put the best foot forward. So, 100%, man. That's all it's about, consistent yeah, effort. Yeah. So what is your physical, what was your training like to become a sniper? Like what was the, I can imagine that there was both a physical component to it and then also a, you know, a cool under fire being able to make decisions under highly stressful situations. How did they prepare you for that as as much as you can or are willing to talk about? Yeah. So physically I was doing CrossFit since about 2011. And I think I started my course in 2013 or something like that. And again, just, just consistently showing up to CrossFit and enjoying the environment and the vibe. And I kept training and, Some days I'd have to do, well, most days I'd have to do two sessions uh, a day. So I'd do like an army PT session, which was sometimes pretty grueling and then go to training at nighttime at CrossFit. And so I just got really used to going through that every single day. And that kind of put me in a place where my, my physical strength was good enough to, you know, run with the big boys in, in the reconnaissance and, and sniper platoon. Um, and then I guess the resilience piece for me came from doing literally exactly the same, just doing those things every single day, just doing hard shit all the time, eventually builds this, this, um, this inner fire, this, this drive, this desire to keep performing at your best. Mm. And so when it got, when it got tough, all I would think about was like, you got this, you got this, let's, let's keep going. You know, you can do it easy. And, mm. and to be honest, I think the first time I ever got that, that feeling was when my brother came up from Melbourne one year and he, he wrote this, he wrote this fitness program out for me that the Melbourne demons were training to. And it was like, it was handed down from some um, 
some running coach and it was like it was like fartlek training on another level and i would have been i would have been maybe 15 16 and he comes up and he's like all right keegs i got this i got this running program and you know you're going to do it twice or three times a week or whatever it was and man it was grueling it was so fucking hard what did it look like and I, it was like um i think the first section was a minute hard minute easy, minute hard, minute easy, minute hard. Then the next section was hard, easy, medium, easy, hard. And then the last section was broken up into 30 second lots. And so the session was, the session was only maybe 25 minutes long, but the hards were like a hundred percent red line hard and the easies were a little jog. And so every time I did this thing, I would, I would run the same loop every single time. And I would get to this, this similar point in the road. And that was like my benchmark. And so on the way home from school, I used to get this anxious feeling within me because I knew how hard I was going to push on this run to beat that, that line on the road that I'd set for myself with these incredibly grueling sessions. And, I, and so where I'm going with this is whilst I was doing those sessions, I started to develop this internal dialogue and, you know, I don't want to be, to be honest, I'm not a fan of David Goggins and the way that he lives his life and, and his mentality around training. Cause I think there's, it feels like there's a lot of suffering and there's just so much pain there. And that's not what I want to promote. And that's not what, that's not what I'm a fan of, but I guess, I, you know, some of these things are important to talk about, to explain how I got to where I was. And so anyway, I developed this internal dialogue that was like, you got this, you got this, keep going 10 seconds. Five seconds. Let's go. Let's go. Push, 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 push. Okay. Rest. All right. Relax. Recoup. Big breaths. All right. Go. Go time. You got this. Come on, man. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. And I, and I developed this habit of like swearing in my head. I was like, fucking let's go. Come on. Fucking go. Run, run, run. <laughs> and kind of like this aggressive guy behind me, like yelling at me. And, you know, the language got like sometimes a lot worse than that and, and probably developed... <laughs> <laughs> developed to be form. like yeah, yeah. <laughs> developed to be a lot worse in the army i was dropping c-bombs as i was running in my head and stuff and really pushing myself but it was like this this um this alter ego this this warrior and and i would probably call it like a um i mean there is a lot of dark warrior in there kind of like the suffering like just fucking push as hard as you physically can and at times especially in the job that I was doing, training to kill people, it's, it's necessary to be good at that job. If you want to show up and be good at that job, you need, you know, to survive, you need that archetype. You need that, that part of yourself to come out and, and you know, really light a fire. Um, and so that's kind of where that started. And then it just continued. And, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get this voice out of my head that just kept saying, like, you can do it you can do it. You got this. You got this. And no matter what I would do, it would just be there. We'd be carrying logs up a massive hill overhead with like 40 kilo packs on. And my back would be aching. My knees would be dead. My arms would be shaking. And I'd be like, you got this. You got this, bro. Come on. You can fucking do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've, it's been interesting because I've had to really observe. I'm getting really excited. I don't know if you yeah, can fucking ride on this. <laughs> this is- <laughs> <laughs> um, <I love> it. <laughs> just, just need to take a breath <sighs> and um, yeah I, I have to really check myself sometimes because over the years the injuries have, have started to pile up and um, and that was a that was a big motivation for me when I transitioned out of the army to start to do the movement practice and start to open up my own gym because I had all these niggles and all these injuries and I was because I just pushed myself so hard like all the time and I didn't know how to relax and so I was really conscious that when I when I transitioned out of the army that this gym this thing that I wanted to build I wanted it to be holistic in nature. I wanted it to be about barefoot strength and movement training. I wanted it to be community focused where people were positive and weren't, weren't standing in front of your face inches from you screaming abuse. I wanted it to be uplifting. I wanted it to be motivating. I wanted it to be, you know, immersed in nature where people could take their shirts off and, and soak the sun up. 
And like through my army experience, I really got a taste of, of how I thought um, I should be living my life to, you know, better myself, my community and the planet. And then how I could pass that information down to, to people that were like-minded and, and also wanted those things. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how the charge movement, the gym started. Yeah, dude, nice. You've taken like four of my questions and just been like, bang, 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 <laughs> bang. This is exactly <laughs> where I wanted to go with you, man. So we can run, we're on the same wavelength. But I'm really good. First of all, to jump back, there's so much gold in what you just said, man. But I want to jump back to what you were talking about, David Goggins. And I think this is a really mm. important, this is a really important thing to bring up. It's a fucking tough line to walk. Mm. Because on the one hand, you're right. The necessities of what you're there to do in the army is not necessarily going to apply to all of the situations of all of the other people that are trying to look at fitness and moving their body and doing whatever and even performance it's not necessarily the same goal or it's not all of the same goals. You know what I mean? There's an extra edge to what you got to do in the army. And there's reasons that you want a person who's trained to go to those dark places, even when that's not the most healthy thing for your longevity and for your, and for your body. Yes. But there's also immense value in that as well. And there's immense value in understanding what you're like under those circumstances. And it's this really difficult kind of dance of injuries and, and longevity and also mm-hmm. understanding what you're truly capable of and, and blowing your mind as far as to how much you can actually push and how much you have left in this reserve. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. How does that show up in your own physical practice and the way that you train other people? Yeah, it's been a massive, massive journey for me because I, I, I personally think that as a society or as a planet where we're operating, you know, oh, well, I feel like a lot of people are redlining and um, we've, we've learned to, we've learned to be um, so stimulated all the time and learned that the only way to survive is for us to work really, really hard all the time. And I guess I've, I've noticed that in my environment and, and where I live, it's just not, it's not required for me to survive. Like there's so many things that are already done for me. And so, and like, I'm no longer training to fight overseas and and kill people. So I guess that helps me justify that my nervous system doesn't always need to be ramped up all of the time. And that sitting in somewhere that's a little bit more parasympathetic nervous system state, a little bit calmer, there's so much gold in there, There's so much gold. And I'm only, you know, over the last two or three years, I've only really started to understand how important that is. And the body can only, the body can only cope with so much stress. And that's where the injury started to, to come from. I was, wasn't sleeping a lot, was drinking heaps of alcohol. Nutrition was terrible. I'd be doing two training sessions a day then I'd be under the immense stress of performing and and like being good at a job. And over time, the body just starts to break down. And then at the six, six and a half year mark, I was, well, it was probably around the five and a half year mark. I really started to ask questions. I was like, okay, if this is the first five and a half years of my army career, what's the next five and a half going to look like? Hmm. Who, how is my body going to operate in the next five and a half years? And so many guys around me were getting surgeries at the age of like 20, 21, knee surgeries, back surgeries. They were going into their back and fusing discs. And I'm like, I'm like, bro, you're 21 years old. Are you serious? This can't be right. This cannot be right. And I essentially just made a decision. I was like, I don't want to live my life like this anymore. I'm ready to do something else. I already had knee pain. already had some disc degeneration in my lower back. And so, yeah, I, I guess it was, all, it was all a massive perspective shift. Like I, I saw how, how hectic I could go, how far I could push my physical, mental, emotional 
self. And, and I saw that where that got me. And then I was kind of looking at, I was trying to find a middle ground. Hmm. I was being like, that doesn't serve me anymore. I feel like I need to come back a little bit. And I, and I'm still struggling with that these days, but, you know, starting the gym in the way that I did and um, the, the things that I introduced there was basically me going on my own self-discovery journey of how do I, how do I uncondition myself from this army mentality and integrate myself back into society at the same time, heal my body. Hmm. And a lot of that was just slowing down, just really trying to slow down. And I've had, I've had a lot of uh, struggle with caffeine addiction. It's almost like my nervous system. My nervous system tells me every day that I need it. I like, I need it to survive. And it's, and it's a very, it's, it's a very big edge for me to stop drinking any stimulants. Um, just cause I'm, I'm so, I'm so wired to be in this state because it, it's, it's got me to where I am. Mm. And so how can I argue that it's wrong if it's got me to where I am? And I'm really stoked about that. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, looking at, looking at that whole picture. Um, and I'm not saying stimulants are bad, inherently bad. I don't believe that anything's bad or anything's, you know, good. It's just, I know intuitively, if I was to really tune in, I know that I don't need it. Mm. To, to live and experience the things that I want to experience in my life. Yeah, dude. Wow. So if you were to, knowing what you know now and having gone through that, that experience of going to those dark places and really and fucking doing, and doing the hell out of it, you know what I mean? You did it for a long time. Would you recommend that other people do that? And how much would you recommend other people do that? Yeah. It really depends on how much you've already done. I think, but the simplest way that, that people can do it is by consistently showing up to a training program, I believe, whether it's running three times a week and setting the next light post to run to as your goal or as you're running, you know, you're feeling a bit tired. You just want to test your, your mental ability. You know, you're running and, and 100 meters ahead, there's a, there's a light pole. And you say, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna run to that light pole and then I'll stop. And then when you get halfway there, pick the next light pole and go, I'm just gonna run to that light pole and then I'll stop. Yeah, you, know, you you get within 50 meters, pick the next one. I'm just gonna run to that next light pole and then I'm gonna stop. And really observe how in control your mind is to your outcome of what you can actually achieve. And it's it goes so much beyond the physical. And so I, I do think people need to, I do think, sorry, not need. I do think people, if they want to, uh, that's, that's the best way to build that resilience piece and to, to test themselves. But I think it's really, really important to learn self-love and know that you're worthy before you embark on this journey. Because <clears throat> me growing up, I had, I had so much love and support for my family. And so my base was like so fucking strong, man. My family was amazing and so supportive of everything I did and really encouraging. And so that really helped me deal with so much stuff within the army because I could, I could head back home on the weekend. And I could go see mom for a big cuddle and she'd cook me food and she'd say, I love you and give you, give me these big kisses and I could jump in the pool and I could roam around the, the land. And, you know, I had, I had that as like a base, a foundation, and then I could come back to the chaos. So, yeah, I, I feel like self-love and, and self-worth, looking back now, has, you know, that's been, that's been a big journey for me, but, but that would be the one thing that I would, I would say that people should explore and, and understand to a really deep degree within themselves before they start to just push their body to the limits or embark on some crazy business adventure or something. Because 
going through that journey, it's going to start to show up some shadowy shit. It's going to start to make people go, well, hang on. Like, why, why am I, why am I doing this business or why am I in this relationship or, you know, why do I run these 50 kilometer races? Who, who is it all for? And like, what am I trying to prove? And, you know, all those big, deep questions. And I feel like those need to be explored before doing the thing because a lot of people, especially within, within my coaching, when we explore these questions, people go, oh, yeah, fuck, I don't, yeah, I actually don't need that $50,000 four-year degree that I thought I, I needed to do. Wow, man, you just saved me $50,000 and, and four years of my life. Or, oh, wow, I don't need to, I don't need to run that 100-kilometer race to, to prove to my partner that I'm, I'm worthy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, dude, what you're talking about is so fucking important. And that's a really, really fucking beautiful experience that you had that growing up, man. And and I love how like genuinely grateful you are for that. You know what I mean? Because that's not everybody's story. And like I remember hearing exactly. I remember hearing, I think it was probably a teenager, like the whole thing about like no one else is gonna love you if you don't love yourself first. And I remember hearing that and think that was a fucking death sentence. Cause man, as a teenager, I fucking hated myself. Mm. And yeah, man, like that wasn't my experience growing up at all. And mm. I remember just not knowing, you know, I'd, I'd heard so many times like, oh yeah, man, you got to go and like love yourself. And I was like, fucking well, man, how the fuck do you do that? I'm a piece of shit. And man, going back to that parts of us thing that we were, you know, we were talking about in the beginning of the, at the beginning of the episode, man, like that has completely changed my fucking life. Mm. And it is something that you can learn no matter how much you might feel that it's not something you can learn or it's not something for mm. you were born with, or it's not something that you had access to for X, Y, and Z reasons growing up. And there were people that had it way worse than me. And I fucking really, I feel that But at the same time, man, like it's, yeah, I think it, looking back from on my own experience, it's very similar to what you were talking about before in the sense of showing up every single day, and moving one step forwards because if you fast forwarded me back six years ago and told me that I'd fucking love myself now, I would have laughed you out of the room. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, I couldn't, that. yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And to even embark on that journey is kind of like you signing up for that course when no one even believed you, you didn't even believe that you were going to fucking come last. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. didn't even believe you wouldn't do it at all, but you ended up doing it. And I think mm. this, uh, this journey can be the same thing. Yeah, I, that makes me think about <clears throat> people that, that have had or, or people that grew up in different circumstances to me and, and what would, you know, how, how would I go about that? Um, because it, man, it can just be so tough, especially when you've gone through something really, really hard and, emotionally and mentally traumatizing. You know, I went through a period in the last, so about 15 months ago, I went through easily the, the hardest period of my life, mentally and emotionally without, with my relationship. And I guess what, what pulled me out of that was actively choosing to, to sit in stillness and allow like whatever was coming up to come up and, and, and not putting judgment on that thing that was coming up and then inquiring further into that and being like, okay, where, where's this story coming from? Like, where did I learn? Where did I learn that? And a lot of this was revealed. This is why I went with, this is why me and Odell went through relationship coaching with, with Jack May. Nice. And man, you know, like ugh, Jack's amazing. He's a absolutely, absolutely amazing at what he does. And he has this beautiful ability to make you feel safe so you can express everything and anything and, and get to the bottom of your shit and sift through that shit. <laughs> and, uh, 
yeah, you know, I feel like a lot of it comes down to one, having a, having a coach or a mentor that, that has a bit of perspective and can lead you, you know, in a direction that you want to go Two is a supportive community that has got your back. That's got your best intentions in mind, whether it's brothers or sisters, as in like not your actual brother or sister, maybe it is, but like, you know, a brother from another mother or a sister from another mother, someone that's looking out for you and has, has, you know, your, your heart in mind and, and wants you to succeed. And then three, having, having like a dedicated um, uh, learning in a uh, dedicated like course or, or learning curriculum. So, and typically that comes from the coach and is, is directed by the coach, but those, those three things in conjunction, I believe can pull anyone out of where they are and take them to a place of where they want to go. Dude, that's fucking, that's such a beautiful kind of way to break it down. And I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more to have a mentor. I believe it's very, very difficult to do something unless you've already seen it being done. It's not Mm -hmm. impossible, but it's very, very difficult. So to even see people that love themselves growing up was not something I really had access to. Mm. It was only when I started to get out into the world and fucking thank God for the internet. You know what I mean? Because I started to see more things around. I saw plenty of other shit too. But I Mm. saw, you know, started to see more examples of people that kind of achieved this and they come from far worse backgrounds and had managed to achieve this kind of thing. And then a group of people who have your back, that accountability in that community. And they don't all have to be your best fucking friends for life, but at least they're all there going through stuff that's more similar than you would believe. And also they've got, they want it for themselves and you want it for yourself. And so together you can kind of go on this. And then through that common interest and that common experience, they do have your back, even if you don't know them that well. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think we were going to go here, but it's so fucking important. And dude, it's amazing. That's why I love running men's circles mm. because in when you're in this circle, you start to express things that are coming up for you, especially when the container is set and it feels nice and safe. You start to express things that are on your mind, and then as it goes around the circle, you realize that every man is in the same fucking shit that you're feeling. Whether it's either on that day or another day, we're all dealing with the same shit, what I've gone through. Like some people have gone through hell compared to what I've gone through and some people have gone through hell compared to what they've gone through and creating that safe container to share in a community environment, like so powerful, dude. 100%. That understanding I think has to start with the idea that you don't have to go it alone and yeah, man, it's like, it's like six years ago tomorrow. Um, I don't really commemorate this too much, but I've decided I'm going to start. Six years ago tomorrow that I made a pretty line in the sand decision. Um, I was in a real, real dark place, by far the darkest place I've ever been in my life. Um, and yeah, May 13th, 2016, I made the decision that I wasn't going to give up. And that only happened because I had been by myself for like three weeks. I'd been avoiding people and jumping houses and just just being real, real fucking depressed. And mm. I ended up something texting a mate just randomly and just been like, oh, hey, man, you, know, you want to go, you want to go out or something like that. And I think I just wanted to kind of go get fucked up and or just like go and take my mind off a problem. You know what I mean? Just leave the house for once. And I mm. just had no intention of opening up or anything like that. But this dude saw the state I was in and we ended up talking for hours and he just fucking really let me in and he really, created that safe space and ended up, we'd end up talking about journaling. I'd never heard of that shit. And he made, made, made me understand that it was possible for me to look at the darkest kind of parts of myself and, and accept that there was a story and there was a reason for those parts. And that if I kind of would accept that, I didn't get to the love bit yet, but I got to the acceptance and at least looking at it and looking at it as it is. And I could own that. And that would take away some of the power from other people the parts of me that were scared of judgment and just that happening, man, that set me on a, I remember I went for that dinner, just crying my eyes out in the middle of this fucking salad bar or some shit. I went home after that and I wrote 5,000 words in a single night. <laughs> and, <it's> fucking... <laughs> and yeah, and that was the beginning, but I couldn't mm. have done that had I not had some real 
chance encounter with a guy that really let me in and showed me that there was a different way. That's beautiful, man. Thanks for sharing. Like, what was his reason for reaching out? <laughs> so I messaged him. And right. the, the, honest, the honest answer is, is because this guy was really good with girls. And um, I knew that if we went out, then maybe he'd kind of like, you know, like we'd talk to some girls together and then maybe, yeah, like I just wanted to do something like that. Yeah, exactly. And that was why I reached out to him first. So it was just by no fuck, means- a, Fuck the problem like, away. Exactly. It was by no means a cry for emotional help at the stage I was in because mm. I wasn't ready to go there and I wasn't ready to look at it. And then fucking, you know, two hours later, I'm crying and try, crying into my salad. <laughs> so <laughs> the, night, the night went a bit of a different way, but I'm fucking really glad it did. <laughs> wow, man. That's yeah, big. Man. Yeah, it was pretty huge. But yeah, man, like I- I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the self-love and the mindset stuff. And I want to jump back in because you've got a lot of experience with physical training as well. And you you ran the charge movement and yeah, you've got this really beautiful blend of the background of the army stuff and the really brutal physical conditioning stuff, but then also the movement practice. And so how have you married that, those two things up together? And what does that physical practice actually look like for someone that might want to be still exploring their own movement stuff and maybe still training for some skills, but also want to get a little bit of that grit from the army side of things. So I, I still really enjoy some parts of, of army training, like, you know, carrying heavy things and, and running with them and carrying objects that are unevenly weighted is really nostalgic for me. And I feel like it's, more of an adventure rather than a um, just a, a run that you might go on or a workout that you might do that's just from A to B and then you stop or do 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 pull-ups or whatever it is. It's really nostalgic for me because I like the variety. So I, I, I include some of that into my, into my week. And then the closest thing for me around here is the CrossFit gym. So I've actually I've gone back to that style of training And for me, it's really important when I'm there to, again, just observe, observe my ego and check myself when I'm doing the workout to not put on 60 kilos just because the workout says 60 kilos and um, really checking myself, check in with myself because I guess what I'm, what I'm really clear on is how I want my body to perform. And it might be a different story if someone's listening and they're wanting to be a, an Olympic weightlifter or they're wanting to run the fastest hundred meter thing, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to set really clear training schedules. You're going to have to train every single day. You're going to have to look after your health like a motherfucker. And, you know, you're just gonna have to show up, just keep showing up, keep showing up and, and, and push your body to the limits. And that's what it's going to take to be a professional in your field, but for someone like me, that's, uh, you know, gone through a lot of that tough training. I just, I just don't desire to be good at only that and pushing my body to the limit. I want to, I want to have that longevity. I want to be able to sissy squat. I want to be able to bend down. I want to be able to handstand. I want to be able to move in all different ranges because for me, I want to be able to go and experience life to the fullest. I want to be able to go climb trees. I want to be able to go, you know, um, swimming in the ocean and, and, and scuba diving. And I want to be able to climb mountains and I want to be able to ride a push bike and I want to be able to jump out of a plane. I want to be able to do all these adventurous things and these, and these really cool, exciting things. So what that looks like for me is it was whilst I'm doing a little bit of some army training and a little bit of CrossFit Uh, I've started to look into a movement practice. And so I'm either going to start doing, well, I'll probably end up doing capoeira. Okay. Because the, the beautiful thing about capoeira is it's, it's like a dance, but it's this, you know, style of martial arts. That's so beautiful and, and so connected with someone else. You know, you're maintaining eye contact. You're doing these handstands body weight movement you're bending and twisting at all different levels and it's so it's so cathartic to do and it makes me feel like my body is capable of handling anything and i love the feeling of of being strong in a body weight sense 
because to me that equals freedom. And as a, as a man, it's my belief that our highest priority is to have this mission and this purpose to ultimately feel free, to have this sense of freedom, kind of like Braveheart, right? It's why all men love sitting on the couch watching Braveheart. They get this or watching Saving Private Ryan and watching the, the, the guys storm the beaches of D-Day. And we all want to be, we all want to go through that struggle and that grind. And then at the end of the day, be the hero that emerges after the battle and um, have, have conquered our, our mission and our purpose. And now we have freedom. And so, yeah, to, to wrap that up, it's kind of like, I, that's how I'm going to, that's how I'm going to achieve my movement freedom and my sense and my sense of freedom in that physical aspect, but also do those nostalgic hard things that I really enjoy. And, and again, just every session, check myself. It's like, bro, how was your sleep last night? Was your sleep good? Or did you get six shitty hours and you're tired? And if you do that snatch, you'll probably pop your shoulder out kind of deal. So, yeah, what, what I do with most of my coaching clients is it's really about helping men find that fire in their heart and find that passion and helping them follow that, but also keeping health at the highest priority. And it's that marrying yeah. of those two. 100% dude. And what I love about what you just did then as well is you started with your own personal desires. And now, mm-hmm. of course, when you go see a PT, you're like, what are your goals? I'll lose three kilos. Yeah, sure. But this is different. You know what I mean? You're talking about what you truly value in, in your life and what you would love to be able to do with your body. And then like what I do with my clients is what I call skill-based strength training. But I always start with that goal in mind. I always start with that, the vision of what they would love to be able to do with their body and truly vision. uncover that. Exactly. It's not just mm-hmm. a goal to lose three kilos. It's like, there's a fucking billion ways to do that. But what you just said was like, okay, cool. I want to be able to move with freedom. I want to be able to do all these different things. And so therefore that's going to inform what kind of training you're going to be doing. And therefore, if you are going to do those death march, fucking, you know, thousand rep, whatever kind of workouts, that's actually going to be counter to what you have stated that you truly want. Exactly. So this is getting really clear on this desire and this vision is going to inform what kind of training you're going to want to do, how you're going to do it much more importantly, and how you're going to prioritize those different things. Yeah. And yeah. Those values, man. Those values are so important. Me and Odell did uh, relationship values, which is, was incredible. And, Mm. and it really got us to a point where, we know what we both desire in our life. So it's intimacy, integrity, acceptance, adventure, and growth. And those are our five pillar values. And so our entire life revolves around fulfilling those, those five values. And then on top of those, if you think about the values as the base, then you've got like the pillars, which is the structure. So it's like, okay, you know, how do we, what does that look like within our, our everyday life? And then the top is like the roof, which is the vision. Like, wh- okay, where are we going? Where are we going with all this stuff? Like what's, what's possible for, you know, our life with these values, this structure, and then the vision at the top. And that's how I kind of like conceptualize it in my head. Yeah, dude, absolutely. And as you know, as, as cliche as, as it is, as soon as you start to build on top of that shaky foundation or it's just missing a bunch of fucking pieces at the bottom, that structure is going to topple real quickly as soon as there's a little gust of wind. So, <laughs> Jenga, and, bro. Yeah, was- fucking 100%. <laughs> and you know, it's okay if those values change over time. It's natural that they're going to evolve and it's natural, but to start to at least get clear on, on what it is for you right now, what it might be for you right now, and then just mm. to put those blocks in place and fucking stress test them a little bit. Do I really give a fuck about this? Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Maybe I need to swap one out a little bit. But you've, uh, yeah, definitely one in, in my kind of, when I've been coached in the past, um, actually another guy I've had on this podcast, Asher Packman, he really helped me get clear on these values. And that's been an absolute base plate for, for me going forward into all different other kinds of work. Um, and yeah, I can only imagine it in, in your relationship as well. It's been a huge, huge part of it. Yeah. It's been massive. 
been, it's been that, that value structure has been one of the biggest transformations for sure. Yeah. Nice. I want to start to kind of finish off with what you're doing now with Unbreakable. And I'd love if you could just give a quick description of that and what it is. Mm. So the mission of Unbreakable is to prove to, to men and women, we've also got women stuff, that you know whatever, whatever thing that they want to achieve in their life, whatever obstacles they're hitting up against, they are capable of moving through those and achieving and, and getting the life that they want to live. And it's also about adventure and, and really experiencing life to the fullest. And like when I was speaking about men wanting to storm the beaches and um, and that's why we love, you know, watching those war movies and we, and we get so sucked into those. It's fulfilling, it's fulfilling that desire to be the hero or be the warrior and, and push their body to a safe limit, but probably above anything they've ever experienced to really, to really experience life, like really experience life to the fullest. And there's so much, there's so much freedom and satisfaction that comes out of the back end of these events because people realize that they've been limiting, limiting, limiting themselves either the last five years or their entire life because mentally they thought that they weren't capable of doing certain things or things were going to be too hard or someone might shut them down or living for for someone else, you know. And these events really crack open that and make people see that. Anything, absolutely anything is possible. And so the way that the event is structured, it's 14 hours overnight. So it starts at 5 p.m. And the event kicks off with a bit of chaos. There's a little bit of chaos because what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to put people outside their comfort zone, but not too far that it makes them want to run away. So we create this this chaos in this safe environment and we get them to form as a group as quickly as possible and start the communication piece. And, you know, as it goes through the night, I I can't reveal too much because it's, it's pretty intense and it's an epic adventure. Um, But as we go through the night, people start to get fatigued mentally, physically, emotionally, and things start to come up for them. And their ego just starts to take a step back because, you know, they're super fatigued and, and these stories that they've been carrying for years, like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not strong enough. I'm too slow. You know, all of these stories come up all the time. And even for the guys that are fit, like I'm a leader and, um, and, um, I'm like the fittest here and I'm like the strongest, like the alpha male stuff. We love digging into those guys and, um, typically what we do is if, if someone's like a real alpha male leader, we'll basically say like, Hey, no talking for the rest of the time. I want you to hang at the back. And then, so they're forced to go from this point of like leadership and like doing everything to like sitting at the back. And they're like, wow, I've never been a follower before. I've never been, I've never been told to like, that's an edge for them. Right. It's like, <laughs> stop, stop leading, <laughs> yeah. sit back and, and observe what it's like to be on the other end of the scale. Um, so yeah, man, that's that's pretty much the event in a nutshell. And that's the outcome that we're looking for to really deliver an experience where people understand that they are capable of so much more than what they thought. Yeah, I love that. And I guess you've seen a fair few men and women go through this already. You know what, you've done a few of these events. And so what are some of the main kind of, yeah, I guess things that come up for these guys, like these preconceptions and I don't know, have you had any kind of feedback after these events as far as how that's played out over the course of the rest of the event and how it's changed for them, if at all? Yeah, typically as soon as they finish, like the first day or two, they have this immense immense feeling of gratitude for everything in their life, Hmm. whether it's, a warm bed or a hot shower or whether it's, you know, their partner cooking food for them or a roof over their head because they've just gone through hell. And so then they, they really start to become grateful for everything, which I think, you know, gratitude is such a superpower. Um, and then post that, 
they have like a bit of an emotional down period where they're like, they're like whole, the whole like what is life kind of feeling and that, that just comes from that part of fatigue. And then after that, they really start to draw they really start to draw a bit of a conclusion from the event and the capacity that they were able to go to to events in their life. So we've had people that were struggling to make like business decisions. And then like within that week, they're like, yeah, man, I quit my job. And now I'm doing something that I love. Or people were not having a conversation with their partner because they were scared. They were afraid that if they were to step into that space, that they would get rejected or the conversation would go bad. But after doing the event, they felt so empowered and they felt so much, um, they felt so much confidence in themselves that, you know, the next couple of days they've they've sat their partner down and they've basically just expressed themselves. And they've both just ended up in this heap of crying mess, which which is beautiful and like embracing each other and, and bringing that spark of, of love and life back together. Um, so that's typically what like kind of happens after the events. People have these really profound realizations and experiences. Yeah, dude. And I think that's something that really has to be experienced. You know what I mean? There's like, there's, I feel like if you're listening to a podcast, you probably listen to one with like, you know what? Fear is just a construct and you can get through it. And, you know, but that's like when you're fucking in it and where those parts are coming up and you're scared as fuck or you're tired as fuck or in it, something like that's happening. And that's like, man, I'll speak from my own experience. That shit has stopped me from doing it so many things in my life stop me from yep. asking for so many things that I actually want stop me from mm-hmm. going and getting things stop me from being consistent with things and so yeah I guess just this there's so much value in the lived experience of doing something doing anything that shows you that at least you get to experience ideally in a controlled environment that mm. those fears are something that you can eventually push through yeah that's why that, I like yeah that's why I love what you're doing. That's why I love even stuff like movement practice and acrobatics, something I've fallen in love with because part of me is shit scared of flipping <laughs> around and being upset. Like, like scared to like a point that I, like that's just like, why are you so scared? Like, like yeah. it's, you know, it's not that scary. You know what I mean? But that, that, that for parts of me, that was really, yeah, really terrifying. And so to kind of incrementally step my way through that and start to in a controlled environment has actually had mad flow on effects for the rest of my life as well. So hmm. go on. I bet. Um, I was going to say, imagine, imagine if, imagine if you woke up knowing that whatever it was that was in your heart that you wanted to do, that you were, that you were capable of achieving that. And then you lived every single day with that fire in your heart and that passion in your eyes to go and do that thing. Imagine how much time and money and and effort you would save on doing other shit and how much, how many distractions you would get rid of. If you knew deep down inside that you were physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually capable of doing anything. And that's the feeling that people come out the other side of. That's fuck. That's sick. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm definitely going to come down and check it, check it out one of these days. Um, 17th, bro. 17th of next month. We're on. Yeah, sick. All right, well, this episode will be out for 17th of June. That's it. Yep. This episode will be out before then. So if you're listening, you're keen to jump on that and you can, I'll leave links in the description for you to go check that out. Um, yeah, man, I want to finish off by asking you one more question. This is kind of taking you back to the army days because like we said in the beginning, man, you've done a lot of stuff. You've done a lot of really cool stuff and you've had a fucking pretty wild journey. But, you know, if you were kind of keeping busy walking down the road, and, you know, you happen to be strolling past a young Keegan because it was on his way to the bus to jump on and, and go join the army. Like what, what, if anything, would you say to him? And what advice would you give him on the other side of all mm. of that shit? I'd give him a big hug and I would say, I love you. Yep. And that's probably it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. that's you know I think it's just so powerful man like just that self love piece Yeah I love you and and follow your heart which is sounds really easy to do but it's fucking really hard <laughs> It's fucking one of the hardest things 
but it's also practicable. Mm. Just like fucking running with a big heavy thing over your head. Yeah. It's, it's no more impossible than that. And yep. the more you try to do it and fail at doing it, the better you're going to start to get it. And exactly. Yeah. It's not going to happen overnight, but yeah, I love that as well, man. Just, I'm just a big, I love you. And because sometimes it's easy to create that narrative when you look back with 2020 hindsight and say, Hey man, if you just knew, if I just knew this back then, and sometimes there's stuff that genuinely would have helped, but at the same time to go through that thing without knowing that thing, to, to confront mm. everything you confront being as fucking lost as you are in that moment, what that does for you on the other side is sometimes a lot better than something that you could have if you could had some comfier pillows along the way. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, I really like the answer. Thanks brother. Thanks for having me on. Dude, this has been fucking sick. I've really enjoyed this chat. Same. Gives yeah, me so man. much energy. Yeah, dude. If the listeners want to go and check out more of your stuff, man, where where should they go and where's the best place to find you online? Instagram is the best place. So if you just type in K-E-A-G-A-N, full stop, B-I-Z-Z-E-L-L, Keegan Bizzle, you'll find me there and you'll find the videos and the links. And if you want to reach out and send me a message, feel free to do that. Dope, man. I'll leave links to order that in the description. And man, this has been great. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, brother. Big love. Go. That's a wrap, guys. Thanks for tuning in from wherever you are in the world. And if you want to take some action around this episode, start to put some of the stuff into practice and maybe even check out Keegan's event that he's got coming up on June 17, the Unbreakable event. You can go over to his Instagram, which is keegan.bizzle. That's K-E-A-G-A-N dot B-A-Z-Z-E-L-L on Instagram. And you'll find all the links to check that out and get registered for that. And as always, guys, if you are interested in building a strength program around things that you would love to be able to do with your body, ticking off your aesthetic goals, but also having way more fucking fun doing it, then you can head over to whitebelt.com slash train. That's W-H-Y-T-B-E-L-T.com slash train and check that out. Submit a coaching application if it sounds like something that you might be interested in. I hope you got heaps out of this one today, guys, and much love, and I'll catch you in the next episode.